Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, carrying out your charitable wishes forever. Whether it's helping shelter animals, feeding the homeless, enhancing the arts, or supporting students. Learn more at leaveabequest.org. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Hamley. One of the outcomes of the Black Lives Matter movement and racial tensions gripping this country is a re-examination of how we interpret history and honor the past. And one area of particular concern is Confederate statues, monuments that honor and glorify a dark part of our past, the Civil War. The debate, leave them up or tear them down. And if they are removed from the public square, where do they go? Is it right to eliminate something that reminds us of an awful past? Or should we keep it as a reminder of what not to do in the future? Confederate statues and another view history lesson. We'll be right back after this news from NPR. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. I am so excited about today's show. You know, our Another View History Lessons are shows that you all really um, enjoy and resonate a lot with our audience, and you don't want to miss today's show as we talk about the uh, debate about Confederate statues and also a possible solution to whether or not these statues should be torn down. But before we get to that, you know, I've been talking to you and talking to you about the coronavirus um, uh, pandemic and about staying safe and about the vaccine and getting vaccine vaccinated. And so for residents of the city of Norfolk, um, the Norfolk vaccine hotline, which is 664 shot, will be shut down as of tomorrow at 4 p.m. Also, the hands on pre-registration help at recreation centers. Both of those will close tomorrow at 4 p.m., February the 26th. And all of the information will be transferred to the state hotline to register for the COVID vac- uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Now, you can go to vaccinate.virginia.gov or you can pre-register by calling 1-800-VAX-NVA. That's 1-877-829-4682. One eight seven seven eight two nine four six eight two to register for your vaccine. Now, if you register locally between now and tomorrow at four p.m., your information will automatically be transferred to the state office or the state registration. Um, but after tomorrow at four, you will not register locally in the city of Norfolk. And so everyone, whoever is listening, wherever you are, if you are a resident of Virginia and you are trying to get registered for the vaccine, vaccinate.virginia.gov or pre-register by phone at one eight seven seven vax vax in for NVA, which is one eight seven seven eight two nine four six eight two. So did you know that there are more than 700 Confederate statues in the United States spread out over 31 states plus the District of Columbia and that the majority were constructed not after the end of the Civil War in 1865, but between the 1890s and 1950s, the same time as Jim Crow segregation? So what was their real purpose and why are so many, why are many now so determined to bring the statues down? Joining us for this Another View history lesson is Christy Coleman, executive director of the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation and an expert on the Civil War. Hi, Christy. Welcome back. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. Glad to be here. Oh, we're glad to have you. And Dr. Arthur Carter, who is spearheading an effort to not erase Confederate history, but to put it in context. He's the founder of the Union Civil War Soldier Monument Advisory and Implementation Committee on Virginia's Eastern Shore. Dr. Carter, how are you? 
Doing fine, Barbara. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so glad to have you. And as a matter of fact, I want to start out with you because you took a little bit of issue to me calling this show uh, Confederate Monuments as opposed to Civil War Monuments. Why is there a difference in your mind? Well, this is about uh, Civil War Monuments, in my opinion. It's about Confederate and Union Monuments. So, and so that's the broader view, and that's the broader conversation that that I believe we will have today. Ah, okay. So you're saying that we need to have both. Oh, we are having both, aren't we? <laughs> Absolutely. And we want to talk about your efforts on Eastern Shore in just a minute. But I want to set some context, um, Christy, first, in terms of this whole idea of why, first of all, why do we do statues and monuments Anyway, to begin with, what is there beyond civil war? What is the purpose of having from from a historical perspective of having these monuments and other symbols? Well, I mean, generally speaking, a monument is placed because a community wants to commemorate an activity, commemorate a person um, that they believe best reflects their uh, values as a community or the community that they're trying to build, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that is generally the, the, the purpose, their connection to one another when monuments are built. Um, I, I if with all due respect to Dr. Carter, I think with regard to Civil War memorials and monuments, we, have a, we might have a difference of opinion about when, where, why, and how the monuments have been impacted. And and truth be told, um, we don't, as we look, you know, throughout the the history of this country, we don't put up monuments to our adversaries as a nation. It doesn't Mm -hmm. happen. You know, it's a a different conversation if you're talking about uh, uh, statues or uh, uh, commemorative pieces uh, mm-hmm. in a cemetery or on a battlefield. But when you're talking about things in the public square, that is something else. And and I think that's the conversation that communities are rightfully having right mm-hmm. now in terms of um, do they continue to support or to reflect a community's value or a community valuing it. And, and furthermore, in all due respect, um, did these communities uh, have the um, have a say? I mean, when we look at the location, I mean, I, I was sharing yesterday online as an example. My grandfather was born in uh, in a place called Cuthbert, Georgia, in southwestern Georgia, small little town. The family had land there. Mm-hmm. And Cuthbert, Georgia, today uh, is a town of roughly four thousand people. Eighty seven percent of its population is black. Fifty-seven percent of its black population lives in poverty compared to five percent of the white population that lives there. And in the center of the town square is a Confederate monument placed in 1896 by the the Confederate Veterans and the Women's Memorial Association. was placed in the middle of this township. And, And such is the case throughout particularly the South that we see when we look at the clusters of where these monuments are, they are in majority black populations, not just today, but at the time. Mm. And that is, and it's something that is being decided upon, not by the residents of those areas, but by the white power elite. And so deciding to place them for specific reasons. And and so let's talk about some of those reasons. Were the reasons for intimidation for and because it, to me it just struck me that these were built during Jim Crow, <laughs> and so it wasn't like they were 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 memor- all of a sudden memorializing these folks. But it seemed like more of a reason than just uh, honoring the past, if you will. That's that would be correct. Um, you know, it's uh, it's. It, they actually, because they are placed at seats of, of local control or power, they, again, have a very different kind of message. And, and to be clear, none of these things are showing up, again, outside of cemeteries until Reconstruction is abandoned and, mm-hmm. and white folks are able to reseize political power by disenfranchising African-American voters. I mean, just an example here in Virginia – um, when the this Virginia Constitution was going through its revision in 1901 to 1902, they did two things. 
Uh, one was heavily restrict voting so that 50 percent of white men would lose their right to vote and 98 percent of black men would lose the right to vote that they had had since as early as 1868 election. Mm. Right. And so uh, in addition to doing that, they also pass a law that if a community puts up these Confederate statues, even if it's paid for with private money on private land or whatever, but it, it, the, the so-called war memorials, right, that they cannot be ever changed, removed, signage added to them, or any of those things. That was Virginia law up mm-hmm. until last year when the Virginia legislature finally puts local control over these things back mm-hmm. to those communities. And I've always argued communities put them up, even if they were, um, <clears throat> even if it was under duress. Um, but communities, <clears throat> these were put up by communities, and therefore communities have a right to determine what is appropriate for them now and into the future. Mm. If they believe that those statues can have context added to them, which is something that, you know, the Richmond Commission before the law was changed did say, add context to them. But even that was illegal under Virginia law. Mm. So um, this is, um, you know, but the intimidation factor was very real. It was a reassertion of white control over black lives and black bodies. That's exactly what these were meant to do. And they, they are also meant to continue to nation build for Southern whites and white supremacists because the language on these statues is not ambiguous at all. It is yeah. very, very clear, um, more than just honoring Confederate war people. It is many of them, most of them, have language of preserving our way of life or, um, you know, reasserting control of the Southern Anglo-Saxon. I mean, some of them actually say the Anglo-Saxon wow. race and the purity of the Anglo-Saxon. I mean, they, they are not, they are not ambiguous is the point. Mm-hmm. Dr. Carter, you you are are advocating or trying to put up or a statue that would go beside the original plan was to put it beside the Confederate um, statue that is in the town. I'm trying to get the te- the name of the town. Eastville, where you Virginia. Are. Yes, Eastville, Virginia. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so in and and that, that statue, the Confederate statue that was there, has recently come down after what happened in Washington uh, in January. Is that right? Well, what we're trying to do, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, is to put up a Union Civil War statue with African-American facial features. Mm-hmm. Because Northampton County has been an African-American majority county from the first U.S. Census of 1790 through to 2000. Mm-hmm. So the original plan was to honor those union, loyal Union African-American soldiers, so-called colored troops, of the Eastern Shore of Virginia, mm-hmm. um, the 7th, 9th, and 10th Regiments. My grandfather, born in slave, was one of those people. And that's the, and that has been the history, that symbolic history, of that has been whitewashed, uh, not allowed in this country. And we're trying to change that narrative. Let's acknowledge all the people, especially those African Americans, the majority of whom in Northampton and the Eastern Shore were African American. Mm-hmm. Over eighty-seven point nine percent. Of the Civil War, of the Union Civil War soldiers on Eastern Shore of Virginia were African American colored troops. Mm-hmm. Where is that history? Well, we want to say symbolic history is important. And let's not continue the Aryan supremacy and, and, and whitewash that, his, that history. Let's acknowledge our entire history. Let's tell the whole truth. Mm-hmm. To tell half a truth is to tell a lie. And, 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 and I would say that. All of these places are public spaces. The county square, museums are public spaces. Cemeteries are public spaces. All of these things need to be in public spaces so we will know what happened, so we don't, won't repeat this, so we know what didn't happen, so we don't repeat that too. So this is where we are here uh, with our um, um, committee on the Eastern Shore. Thank you for asking, Barbara. Mm-hmm. And, and I would just say that 
I don't believe Christy and I will have any disagreements, <laughs> or, or if, if any, there will be contacts and not a and not a substance. I've been following Christy's wonderful career, and I'm very proud of her and, and the work she has done and, and is still doing. Oh, You're so, very kind. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So uh, I'm curious, though, Doctor Carter, you. Uh, in 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 the the construction of the monument that you would like to see, you wanted to name all of the Union soldiers as well as the Confederate soldiers. Is that your way of saying that we need to to um, incorporate both so that we have the full story? Is that what what the a- attempt is? Absolutely, to tell the full story. To intentionally tell half the story is to tell a lie. A- and yes, they were enemies in war. And let, what we're saying is that they be partners in peace, from enemies in war and partners in peace. Let's stop the divisiveness and let's, and do, let's do some reconciliation together. So we hope that this will be partners in peace to list near, near in, in, a, in a public space, mm-hmm. all those names of every single Eastern Shore um, Confederate, uh, excuse me, Confederate and Union soldier together with their ethnicity and the units they served in, mm. so that their descendants and, and, and will come and see their great-grandparents, their grandparents, great-grandparents, their great-uncles, et cetera, et cetera, and acknowledge that. And let's teach the whole history of Aryan supremacy in this country, stars and bars and stars and stripes, stars and stripes. The United States of America was founded on Aryan supremacy. Mm. So was Stars and Bars, the four-year history of the Confederate Stars and Bars, founded on the enslavement of Africans. Mm-hmm. Stars so, and Stripes, 96 years of enslavement of African Americans, from 1776 to 1865, and then Jim Crow on top of that. Let's tell the whole truth. Hmm. So we're watching each other on Zoom, uh, audience, since we're also on the radio. Chrissy, I'm looking at your face. You want to respond? <laughs> no, ma'am. No, ma'am. <laughs> well, let me ask this question. Um, the, according to the Southern, um, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center, about 100 statues have come down in 2020 roughly 94, 94 to 100 uh, in 2020, um, many of them after what happened with George Floyd. So there seem to be three major events that have caused these statues to start coming down across the country. One, the first was was uh, Charlottesville. There was um, the massacre at um, Mother Emanuel Church where the nine, uh, the pastor and eight of his congregants were murdered. Um, and uh, And then what happened to George Floyd. Um, Christy, do you think that that it is always going to take monumental, pardon the pun, um, events in order for us to, as a country to come to figuring out what to do with these types of not only statues, but it also goes down to street signs and flags and and um, markers. And I mean, there are many different ways that the Confederate story is still being told in the public square. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that certainly happened uh, since these key, these sort of pivotal, pivotal events mm-hmm. uh, of the last five years I think what is happening is people are assessing all kinds of public monuments. So, for example, in New York City, you had the removal of the uh, Mims, Miriam Mims statue from Mm. from, uh, Central Park uh, Mm. and moved to his and moved to his grave site uh, because Marion Sims, uh, known as the father of gynecology, um, experimented on enslaved women. Mm. Um, without any kind of anesthesia. He just did what he did. And, and so, um, and it, it, uh, it, so they have, you know, relocated him. Uh, we're seeing, this isn't just a phenomenon also that's happening in the United States. I think Black Lives Matter made it a global movement of really looking at um, uh, symbols and, and images of white supremacy the world over. And so you saw a statuary coming down either by force or by uh, legal means. 
in communities all over. So really, since 19, since 2015, yeah, about about 100 or so came down last year in 2020. Um, a number of those extra legally, but but you right. know whatever. Um, but I think uh, of the original 700 plus that are uh, in the United States, specific uh, specifically that are are, are Confederate related, mm-hmm. um, those. There's probably close to to 200 that have come down since 2015, mm-hmm. or other types of symbols um, that are that are leaving the landscape. In other communities, they're talking about it, uh, making decisions for themselves, um, or waiting for legislative change. Of which sometimes those legislative changes don't happen, and you know, especially in places like you know Mississippi and Tennessee and which is real Tennessee is always interesting to me because, you know, it, they had uh, uh, forces in both armies and represented representation as did Missouri in both governments, right, for mm-hmm. a while. And so I just find it really interesting. And then, you know, to see a place like West Virginia, right, where people will fly Confederate flags and have Confederate statues in West Virginia, a state that we have because they refuse to join the Confederacy, to be a part of the Confederacy, right? Wow. But yet today, you know, 150 years later, there are Confederate monuments throughout West Virginia. There are Confederate monuments in states that weren't even a state or territory of the United States at the time. Um, I think, you know, uh, Dr. Carter is, is right when he stresses that the United States is built on the premise of, of wealthy white men, uh, being those that are in charge, uh, uh, um, notions of white supremacy, without a doubt, with slavery existing uh, in this new nation. But slavery for the first time, well, I shouldn't say this for the first time, but was, mm-hmm. was being challenged in the re- revolutionary era to where we, we would no longer see slavery in all 13 colonies as it had been in, in, in advance of the uh, American Revolution, where states found that this new nation, the creed of this new nation, that all men are created equal— was inconsistent with practice. And so those uh, economies that could and did, either through outright abolition or gradual emancipation because of the American uh, Revolutionary War, and so we'll be celebrating or commemorating the 250 of that in just a few years. But, Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess my my larger point here is that the, the grand difference was what the Confederate government strove to be was it would have been the first republic in the world to explicitly, explicitly state that they were a nation state being established with the concept that white men were superior to all others and that slavery was the natural state for Africans and their descendants. There was no other kingdom, republic, or anything else in the world that did that. Wow. Stated that explicitly in its constitution and in its formation of its nation. And so, um, again, there, I think, are the, the, the key distinctions that we need to keep in mind. And, and, and I applaud those who seek reconciliation around this history and understanding, but reconciliation, as Dr. Carter says, has to start with truth. And you cannot reconcile the, these facts that the people at the time were explicit about. Oh, they lied a lot when the war was over, changing the the meaning of the war into states' rights and all of this other nonsense that that they created in the lost cause mythology. But they were quite explicit going into the war, whether they were slaveholding or not. It was about building a, a, a nation where white rule was, it. Was everything, and I am I and I found it so fascinating that white women, this the United Daughters of the Confederacy, were responsible for paying for the these statues the and putting these up. Them, the vast yeah. majority of them, that's yeah. just incredible. Four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero are the numbers to call to join our conversation. What do you think? Are we erasing history if we take down these statues, or it, should we leave them up as a reminder of what not to do in the future? Four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero. So I want to ask both of you and Christy, I'm going to start with you. How do you answer that question when people say, well, if you take them down, you're just erasing history. You're acting like you're it never happened. History. No, it's nonsense. <laughs> it's nonsense. That history is always going to be there. And, and frankly, 
These statuary are not history. They are memory, and there is a difference. They are about memory and, and, and how someone chooses to commemorate, but they are, I can, I'm telling you, they are not history. They might even be art, depending on their design, depending on a whole variety of things, mm-hmm. but they most certainly are not history. We can take a picture of it and have a record of it, and we do. <laughs> Without necessarily having it, um, so I'm, I, I I reject that particular argument that somehow it is history. Um, I, I just do. Uh, we hang on. Being Dr. a public historian, that's what I do. I reject that notion. <laughs> Dr. Carter, I'm coming to you in just a moment. But if you're just joining us, it's in another view history lesson on the debate about Confederate statues with Christy Coleman, executive director of the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation and an expert on the Civil War, and Dr. Arthur Carter, founder of the Union Civil War Soldier Monument Advisory and Implementation Committee on Virginia's Eastern Shore. Four four zero two six. Six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero. So, Doctor Carter, if we don't build the statue, if you don't build the one that you're talking about, if we take down um, all the other Confederate statues, are we erasing history? Well, if we continue not to honor those loyal Union so African American Union soldiers. What we are doing, we, we are ignoring history. And I, would, and I would argue that monuments are symbols of history. Symbols of history. The United States was, was founded on implicit Aryan male supremacy. Implicit. Mm-hmm. Implicit Confederacy founded on explicit. Mm-hmm. But they are, they are the same. Implicit and, 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 ex, and implicit and, and, and explicit, the same Aryan supremacy, both of them. So on the Eastern Shore, we will put this up. We will have a Union Civil War soldiers' African facial features to honor this, um, to, to honor them. And, I, and this is happening all over this country. We are seeing all over this country that we have not been honoring those loyal African American Union soldiers with symbolic history um, optics, which are monuments okay. that reflect the times. It is long since overdue that we have these Union Civil War monuments with African-American facial features to honor those loyal colored troops, so-called colored troops, um, in this country. And it's happening all over. And it's certainly going to happen in the eastern shore of Virginia. Okay. Uh, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Kit joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Kit. You're on the air. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Oh, thank you so much for taking my call, and thank you so much for having this wonderful conversation. Thank um, you. Full disclosure, I am a young white man living in Virginia with a long family history in Virginia back to the 1600s. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say how much I agree with everything that your distinguished guest said. I am so sick of hearing all of the arguments that this is, it's heritage, not hate. It's history. You're erasing it. It's false. It's, I studied history at the University of Virginia. This is, I just wanted to say to any other uh, white listeners out there that this, it is, it is past time that we step up to the plate and really start in confronting the mythology of the past, the mythology of the lost cause and of white supremacy, and stop leaving it always up to people of color, courageous people of color, to force social change in this country. We need to wake up and we need to move forward. I support the um, African featured uh, union statue uh, because I feel like that is something that deserves to be honored. And to the idea that we are erasing history by removing Confederate monuments, monuments aren't aren't uh, uh, history, and I would say that they're not even memory, they're mythology. Maybe a mm. good monument is memory, but these monuments are mythology. Uh, the text on uh, uh, Robert, um, 
Bedford Forrest III's monument said he struck like a titan and fought like a god. That is myth, and we need to be rid of it. And, and there are so many better parts of American history that we can honor, but we have books to record our history, and we need to record it fairly. And I think that we need to center African-American voices in the discussion of what to do with these monuments. And I won't take any more time from your wonderful guests. Thank you so much for taking my call. I appreciate the call, Kit. Now, go ahead, Chris. Do you want to react to what he said? I I (laughs) thought it was uh, quite a cogent uh, comment coming from your listeners. It was was very nice to hear. Um, Yeah, I mean, you know, the the thing that I I really appreciate about Dr. Carter and, and what he's trying to do here is really about narrative correction. You know, we hear all the time, you know, you should learn history so you don't repeat it and, and, and other types of things like that. Well, the problem often is, is that we aren't even getting the correct narrative to begin with. So there's no wonder we keep having these these repetitions of really of, of violence and and um, disenfranchisement because we, we don't and haven't been taught and or don't explore these questions in the backgrounds on our on our own. So we keep going through these cycles. Um, I particularly applaud the, the final comment that the caller had about folks stepping up. And I will say people of good conscience of all ethnicities and races have been a part of this from the beginning. So the suggestion that often one hears, at least I hear, is that of, of somehow – you know, we can't judge by the past by our contemporary mores. There's a certain mm-hmm. truth to that. But at the same time, there were people of the period who are saying all of this is wrong, even as they are going up. So, you know, we have to we have to be mindful. And 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 really, it's about the dignity of humankind, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I mean, Absolutely. that's what we're trying. Everyone deserves dignity and respect. Uh, especially in a, a society like ours, um, it, it, this, but we can't, we cannot get there if we keep obfuscating what really has happened in our past, in our collective past. Mm-hmm. Doctor right? Carter, did you want to react? Um, yes, I, I too um, concur with what Chrissy is saying, and and I appreciate what the gentleman uh, said, uh, calling in. Um, yes, and what Christy mentioned was European Americans and African-Americans have always been part of a righteous movement to abolish enslavement, to do the right thing, have always been part of that. And, and European-Americans and African-Americans together got into this trouble, and I believe European-Americans and African-Americans together will get out of this trouble uh, together and, and, to, and, to, and to teach a more truthful and honest history of where we have been, where we are, and where we are going to go, Sankofa, to to take that forward. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to happen. And anyone who wants to support our our movement on the Eastern Shore to to put this statue, just email me at art at motherland.com, and I'll be happy to keep you uh, up to date on our progress. Okay, that's art at motherland.com. That's correct. Correct? Okay. Our phone lines are lit up, so let's take some calls. Greg joins us from Hampton. Hi, Greg. You're on the air. Yeah, there. Uh, thanks for uh, having me on. And I've been listening to the uh, commentary, and it's interesting. But I would like to just add my thought on it. Mm-hmm. Um, first of all, I don't think what happened during that period of our history is a myth. And I also don't think that all Confederate monuments, if that's what you want to call them, are the same. Uh, when I came, I'm from the north. In fact, my whole family's from Wisconsin. And I've been in uh, Hampton area for 14 years. And one of the things I decided to do when I came down here, I majored in history when I was in college, was to drive around and take a look at these monuments and just see where they are and see what they've said. And I think anybody that wants to enter into this conversation needs to do that uh, because it's not the same. There's monuments, and I don't know if you want me to mention the towns, that just memorialize the people that are from that area that were killed during that conflict. Uh, I was. I just heard somebody say everybody deserves um, dignity and respect. Many of these monuments are just that. They're in respect and dignity to the people that served. They didn't say if they served good or bad. They just said they served. 
and they say they named the name of the, of the divisions and the companies they were in. Was it a cavalry unit? Was it infantry? And they perished. Many of those people that are on those monuments still have relatives alive today. So there's a heritage there. All the monuments are certainly not a myth, and all the monuments are not the same. Um, okay, let, let me let let me let our guests respond because we are we are, um, are running short on time, and I want to give them a chance to respond to what you're saying. Thanks so much for the call, Greg. Um, Christy, go ahead. Uh, point well taken. They are very different. Um, again, and I and I said that I think at the top of my remarks. I said, you know, depending on there's a difference from the ones that are in cemetery spaces, memorials that have been placed there, um, ones that are on battlefields that do just that. It is often, though, and in terms of uh, the use of the term mythology, there is a mythology called the lost cause, which I was going to ask um, you to explain that. Yeah, that's that's that is a. Some have even argued it is a response to trauma, to go through denial and anger and all those things, and you create something else, right? Um, the, the, so I'm, I'm appreciative of the idea. What, what is more problematic is when there is no recognition of the other people who also sacrificed and honored in those same communities. Over a million African Americans will run away and join the United States federal government army. Men, women, and children, over 200,000 black men, most of them from the same township and site that there are not monuments to their sacrifice and courage. There, you know, there just isn't. Mm -hmm. And so it's uneven. um, And it's, and it's, you know, it, it's a really um, uh, fascinating thing um, when you do, again, look at it. But I think it's also important to look again when they are built is just as important as where. Just yeah. as important. So when you're making those rounds, look at when those things are dedicated. Look at where they are placed. Because there is a difference, and the and the major the major discussion really is around those monuments that are in public in the public square, the ones that are right next to the courthouse, the ones that are next to city hall, the ones that are in the middle of the town, if you will, um, and and that is um, as opposed to those that are in cemeteries uh, and so forth. So here's the question: If we tear them down, where do we put them, Doctor Carter? Let me start with you. Um. Well, I'd like to um, respond oh, to the sure. earlier question. Okay, uh, yeah. that's fine. Sure. Um, yes, they are n- all mon- All those Confederate monuments are not mythology. Um, some are. The Confederate monument in Lynchburg that that commemorates the so-called Lion of Lynchburg, right in the middle of town. I've seen it. That's mythology. This lion that that, that out tricked and. He was a lion. Well, he wasn't a lion. He was a, a man. He was a traitor to the Union Army. The Confederate statue that is now in Eastville, Virginia, the capital seat of Northampton County, that is a statue of a rank-and-file Confederate, not a single mm-hmm. man, not a name. And it is dedicated to the Confederate Union, African-American and European American Confederates of, of the Eastern Shore who served in the Confederate Army. This both there were African Americans and European Americans who served in both armies. Uh, say yes. Say that one uh, more time. You said that they were both African Americans and Confederate soldiers that served in the Confederate Army. Of course, um, Irvin Jackson, curator of. of um, uh, at the African American curator at UVA has documented that, and many people have documented. A fr- there were two. There are two on the Eastern Shore. Two, two out of twelve hundred um, Confederates were African American. Two. We have them documented in our history. Uh, there were no more than one thousand three hundred uh, nationally in the Confederate Army, and there were almost two, two hundred thousand. Uh, in the um, African American in the Union Army, so let's tell the whole, Chris, whole the whole story. Two African 
American Confederates in the Eastern Shore of the Eastern Shore of Virginia. We, I have their names, the units okay. they served in. And most were body servants. Most were body servants, uh, but some were snipers. Some guarded um, Confederate wagons, and they were armed. Um, most were body servants, cooks, and, and menial servants, just like many in the Union Army and Navy were were menial servants. Too most were most were warriors. Some, especially in the Navy, were were cooks and and and, and things like that. Okay, let me let Christy respond to you. Christy, you, you I'm, take. I'm, I'm just going to say I'm going to recommend a book um, called uh, "The Myth of the of the Black Confederates" by uh, Kevin Levin. Um, because this is this is this is something that uh, started as a movement among the Sons of Confederate Veterans in the 1970s. The Confederate government, the historical record of the government of the Confederacy and their debates around whether or not to allow black men as soldiers, is very clear. They did not do that until. Uh, March of 1865, and those men never saw. There was only a thousand who were allowed to, who did sign up. You're right about that number, a thousand. They never saw combat. The majority were, in fact, um, body servants and were used to supply the Confederate armies for their for their labor, so that white men would be the ones to fight. Um, there is an extraordinary amount of. But yes, African American, these men who served as body servants or, 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 or what have you, many of them did get pensions. And, and that is the, mm. that sliver of documentation about pensions from the Confederate Army is what was incorrectly used. So again, I'm going to recommend the book. Um, and you talk about Dr. Irvin Jordan, I know him well. Uh, Dr. Jordan's work has been in those archives. Uh, he served on my board when I was at the American Civil War Museum, and, and he will tell you himself those early records are often misinterpreted um, in terms of what these black men were actually doing in, in, in service to the Confederacy. Um, they were enslaved men. They were not allowed to serve as soldiers. And, um, you know, there there is uh, certainly... Uh, we can certainly acknowledge that there are individuals who, through their loyalties to certain white families, if a young white man who was his, his owner fell and dropped his weapon, that there are certainly accounts of black men uh, standing up to protect them and taking that weapon and firing on the enemy. That does not make him a soldier. Can you tell us and, the name of that so book again? You know, it's, it's called The Myth of the Black Confederate. It's by Kevin Levin. Or, or Levin, Levin. Levin, right? okay. So, uh, it's L I V I N, Kevin okay. Levin. Okay. Uh, and it's a it's a fantastic book, and all of those people. What's fantastic about it is the ones that are often trotted out as examples of the Confederate. I mean, you've got them by name, where they're from, what they did, you know, all of that um, to address it um, in a really comprehensive way. There's also several lectures. If you don't want to read the book, uh, just go to YouTube or Google him. Mm-hmm. And there are several lectures where he, he offers this information and documentation uh, since the release of that of that seminal book that Dr. even Dr. Jordan uh, has has said is is just an extraordinary piece of scholarship and and getting it right. Okay. So I, I applaud everyone and and thank you so much. All right, let me go to the phone lines. Jordan joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Jordan. You're on the air. Hey, how's it going? Good morning. Okay, good morning. So or afternoon now. <laughs> yeah, afternoon. Um, you asked where to put the, the statues, and I would sure. suggest that we leave them in place and then commission artists to find a way to properly tell the whole story. So initially when I had thought about that, I was saying, well, just take the statue and flip it upside down and make sure that you tell the story underneath really well so that <laughs> those that, that did bad things can be can be shamed. As they as they deserve to be, or find a, a neat way to express um, just express the whole story. So don't take them down. That way, the people that want them kept there are, are get their way, and then we can we can make sure that we send the message moving forward. That those types of behaviors uh, were they're just not um they're just not okay. Right? Okay. So. Thank you, Jordan, for the call. We appreciate that. Let's go to Elizabeth in Virginia Beach. Hi, Elizabeth. You're on the air. 
Hi, thanks for taking my call. Uh huh. Okay. So I'm a military kid, grew up all over the, the country. I'm a military spouse and moved all over the country, uh, north, south, east, west. I have seen Confederate monuments in Washington State. And the entire time I lived in Alabama, I never saw a single Union one. And it wasn't that I was out searching for them. They may be there, but they were not prominent. Mm -hmm. And so when people say it's about heritage or it's about history, I just think, well, then why aren't you telling the other side of the story in the place you live? So how would you feel if there was a statue to Sherman in the middle of Atlanta? Because he was instrumental in their history. And yet every time I mention, let's have a statue of Sherman on a horse, I get a lot of pushback about we don't want to be reminded of that horrible time. Exactly. Mm. All right. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. We appreciate that. Anyone want to respond to Elizabeth? Go ahead, Dr. Carter. Uh, yes. And I'd like to, um, Elizabeth, makes, Elizabeth makes a good point. And I'd also like to recommend, I have um, um, Levin's book that, um, um, that was um, um, just recommended, but also like for people to 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 read Irvin Johnson's book entitled "Black Confederates and Afro Yankees in Civil War Virginia." That's Irvin L. Jordan's "Black Confederates and Afro Yankees in Civil War Virginia." Um, so yeah, that's um, so yes, I, I too think that we need to look at the whole history and and. We need to put things in context, too. And many of these monuments are of rank-and-file people um, and, and not of particular people. And, yes, we do need to be sensitive to, I think, to the feelings of, of everyone. Uh, and, of course, you're not going to be able to please everyone, uh, but you're going to be able to um, hopefully do, do, the, do the right thing and be sensitive and empathetic. Uh, empathy is an important thing, I believe, for for all of us to be empathetic and 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 be empathetic to uh, to, to both sides, and that's all I have to say on that now. Okay, let's go to Maurice in Norfolk. Hi, Maurice, you're on the air. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Uh huh. Um, I was thinking, like, um, it might be a good idea to take um, direction from Germany after after the Holocaust and World War Two. It there's they will not um, erect any statues of any infamous Nazi, and it's also illegal to to display swastikas in public. So like they do belong in museums if they're in Germany or in cemeteries. And I just thought that that's like a direction maybe we should follow. Okay. Thanks for the call. Christy, I've heard other people say that um, also, that that's a a good example of, of how to handle negative history, if you will. Well, I mean, you know, the, the, the challenge that we have in the United States is our first amendment. Right. We have our First Amendment right to to speak, but that doesn't mean you don't have consequences of that speech. It just means that the government can't mandate a consequence unless you have placed someone in danger. Unless you have yelled fire in a theater, then you absolutely can be sent to jail if Mm -hmm. someone dies or whatever. Mm -hmm. But in the United States, you do have the right to free association. So if you want to be a little neo-Nazi, you can do that. Do that. You know, you can think that, you can be that. I think for us as a nation, it's, it's, it comes back to making sure that we have, um, you know, that we have built out and are, and are teaching a really comprehensive approach to our historical shared past. Um, I, I think um, that is, is one of the ways that we can do it. And, and part of the challenge that we have is that, you know, here again, it's about local control of education. And those same United Daughters of the Confederacy who helped fund all of those statues also had significant influence on the education of millions of generate well, not millions, millions of people through multiple generations in the South, mm-hmm. black and white, where they made clear, and these things were actually Um, still in play as late as the mid-1970s, where if a textbook or a book said that the South did not treat her slaves well, that Jefferson Davis or Robert E. Lee were traitors, if it said, I mean, there's just a variety of things that were a part of their catechism, if those books, they were not allowed 
not allowed in the library, not allowed for school-age children. They were not allowed. So is it any wonder why we have such a disconnect? Because they were controlling the narrative that advanced their point of view, heritage, where they wrote that Reconstruction was a complete failure. It was not. It was an extraordinary period of time of, of the expansion, the rebirth of a nation. Um, and so it's, I think, again, we, we are woefully, uh, woefully um, undereducated in terms of our historical truth. And we will have to continue this conversation. Dr. Carter, give us your email address one more time if people want to get in touch with you to find out more about your efforts on the Eastern Shore. A R T at motherland.com. Okay, that's Dr. Arthur Carter, and he is the um, uh, founder of uh, the Union Civil War Soldier Monument Advisory and Implementation Committee on Virginia's Eastern Shore. Dr. Carter, thank you so much for joining us. And Christy Coleman, I'm going to see you on Saturday at yep, the After Angelo Saturday. event at Jamestown Settlement. Um, I hope everyone will try to join us at uh, Jamestown. We will be talking from 2 until 3 uh, in the afternoon, and we're going to talk about um, inclusion, inclusion, history and inclusion. Absolutely. So thank you so much for joining us today and that is Christy Coleman she is the executive director of the Yorktown Jamestown Foundation and thank you so much to all of you for spending your lunch hour with us today if you'd like to hear uh, this show again or share it with a friend please visit our website anotherviewradio.org and download the podcast and while you're there please sign up for our eview newsletter it's a once a week reminder of upcoming shows we're on Facebook so like us and I'm on Twitter at Barbara Ham Lee. And I want to remind you again about the new way in order to register for your vaccine um, in the city of Norfolk and throughout Virginia, for that matter. And that is vaccinate.virginia.gov or you can call 1-877-VAX-NVA or one 800 I'm sorry, 1-877-829-4682. It is so very important that we get our vaccinations done. Uh, After Angelo is happening on on February 27th from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. at the Jamestown Settlement. And they're going to be um, the... Uh, Traditional African Libation by Corey Staten and the performance by Atapam Dance Theater. Uh, And the rest of the day will have art, music, storytelling, and our community conversation. Christy Coleman and I, everything will be socially distanced and be safe, but we would love for you to come out to Jamestown Settlement this Saturday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. And I'm looking for a website uh, in order to just Google Jamestown Settlement and website will come up. Do you have it, Christy, if you're there? <laughs> Is, can we bring Christy's audio in? Okay, go ahead, Christy. What's the website? It's jyfmuseums.org. JYFmuseum.org. We sure hope that you will join us there. And as I remind you every week, the coronavirus pandemic is not over yet. Please be patient and persistent in setting your appointment for your vaccination, understanding that healthcare workers are working as fast as they can to administer the vaccine and they have no control over how much they receive. So we'll get there if we all stay patient. Our theme music is an original composition especially for Another View by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Todd Washburn is our audio engineer. And Jordan Christie answered our phones. And hello to Kier Askew, a George Mason uh, University graduate who joined us today. We'll see you next Thursday for Another View. Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, partnering with donors from all walks of life to improve southeastern Virginia through grants, scholarships, and leadership initiatives. Learn more at hamptonroadscf.org.